welcome to worship this morning. Today we welcome back our mission team and we look forward to hearing from them soon about their experiences that they had as they went on our behalf to help God's people in Onamuga. We've got so much to be thankful for this morning. You might, you might have had an ordinary week this week, but you still have reasons to stand up and bless the Lord and declare your praise to him this morning.
first, the first Bible reading this morning is Genesis 12, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Amen. So we're very excited that we can share with you what we did with the PNG mission trip. This is a picture of Onamuga. On the left-hand side, you actually, first of all, you see a road that goes in between. On the left-hand side is the school, but what we did on the right-hand side is actually Onamuga Station, which is where the Salvation Army runs and operates. The building closest to the road across from the school is actually um, the Citadel at Onamuga. That's actually the hospital that we connected water to, but we actually, and the next one after that. Onamuga is very hilly. Just get to the top and then you realise that the spanner that you need is all the way back down to the bottom. <laughs> now, I don't know about everybody else, but I lost five kilos while I was away. <laughs> so, and I'm looking forward to putting it back on. When we got there, the water was already connected to the village but what wasn't there was water to run into the tank. So what we had to do, we were tasked then to, <laughs> to walk further up the hills. Um, if the water source to, that Onamuga had, um, looking from where we were to that was about five kilometres, you know, as the crow flies. But to walk it was like 4,000 kilometres. <laughs> so it's up and down, up and down and up and down. So us Australians were struggling going up and down and it was very humbling when you had 70-year-old men walking past you telling you to hurry up. <laughs> the Salvation Army put in some new tanks. Um, the one at the top was 44,000 um, litres. The one down the bottom was about 20,000 litres. The problem was, was that the water would run to the ground level. Um, the tank was up yay high. So everything is gravity fed and those that understand pumps and the likes, there is no head pressure to push it down and up and into the tank. So we had to go in and try and figure out why that was. What we found out was that everybody would cut the um, poly pipe and decide that they had a right to it. And it was very funny, um, one of the people that said to us that too many people are cutting and joining onto this pipe illegally was one of the people that cut onto the pipe illegally. <laughs> so that, that, that was quite amusing. So once we had a look at that, we, we went back to Tulay and got our um, equipment that we needed. We then actually welcomed our team. This is um, welcome our team in Lay. So as we said, that's the hospital that we needed to run water to. We found that there was a pipe that sort of went down to the building, but it, there was no pressure. Because so what we decided to do was that we were going to redirect all the water. So we actually dug all the, the old pipe out of it. We ripped it out of the ground, which actually was very easy because it was only under the ground like an inch and a half. So we dug that out. We ran it down the hill. Next slide. Joined it up, and that's the, closest, that's the only time Richard was actually working. <laughs> so we go to the next one. So we dug it in. We buried the pipe. The next one. And then it went down to the middle um, tank, which, once again, the experts were there keeping an eye on what we were doing. <laughs> so once, once we connected it up, so we actually had a, a very good flow. So everybody was excited and overjoyed. So from that point, we then had to get the water back up to the hill to the first tank. So we decided to unroll some poly. And if we go to the next picture, too many experts. <laughs> So the poly tank, the poly pipe went up to the top tank and then we joined it to the bottom tank. We were then able to connect it into what we call the pump house. So that was Major Rod telling us all the things that we had done wrong. <laughs> Once we did that, we were then able to connect it to the hospital. The, the, the only downside was that they've never had that much pressure in their life. So then everything decided to leak. So then we spent the next three days really going over and making sure that all the um, valves and the connections um, were going because we filled the top tank, which I think I said was 44,000 litres. That was all gone overnight. 
So the, the locals were so excited that there were the, the washing, I've never seen so much washing on the lines. Overnight, we put a, another tap down at the core building um, to provide water down there. But overnight, all the locals were coming with their big buckets and drums and, and et cetera, filling everything up. So we actually overnight lost all the water. So we pumped it all up again. And then the following night, we lost all the water as well in the sense that people were just overjoyed. But one, one of the greatest things for us was that all the locals helped. If you have a look at the next picture. <clears throat> so Dave and Steve, and I think Jay was there, I can't remember who else, um, but they actually were able to get the, um, the shower and the toilet running in the hospital so that um, when mums gave birth, they were actually able to go to the, to the toilet wasn't running at all. Um, they were able to get the shower and the toilet running for the hospital. So that was really cool. So we were very blessed that we also had electricians that come over with us. And this is a picture of them hard at work. <laughs> so every time we said, where are the electricians? That it was time to have a Monte Carlo, which was not theirs to eat. <laughs> and they were having coffee. But when they were working, the next slide... Um, they did very well, so they went around on a Mooga checking all the power points, checking what needed to be done. They, when we went back to headquarters or the DHQ where we were staying, they were able to go around and look at the different um, problems that were there. So this is our farewell. The next one is our farewell um, from on a Mooga. And it was very humbling for a lot of our, um, our team because they put on a, a moo. A moo is... They're, it's like a hungi in New Zealand. It's a traditional way of cooking a meal. But what they did was that they gave us, um, um, how do I explain it, place to sit and eat, but they just watched us eat because they, they wanted to bless us. And it was very um, overwhelming because, you know, these people have very little to nothing, but they gave us the best that they had. Uh, so... Many of you brought in gifts, um, you know, pencils, pens, bags, um, stationary things, little toys, all that sort of stuff. Well, this is where it went to. So that's um, Captain Dulcie, and I think last week you actually got to see the kids singing. And um, these are the orphans that came from um, the area around. So each of the orphans, they do have a guardian, um, but I guess it's... <laughs> loosely based on our foster system. Um, so it was really lovely to be able to um, spend some time with these kids and um, to bless them. And so we were able to hand out all the gifts and they love the chocolate. So thank you for that. that that's our amazing team. So we, we were very blessed with everybody that was a, was a part of it. We worked well together. I believe that God put together the right crew of people that actually went over there. So we, we are ever thankful for each and every one of them. But we're also thankful for each and every one of you because your generosity and the generosity of Bandan Macor um, and also Bandan Macor, Bundaberg, the generosity of both the core and yourselves, we would not have been able to get over there. So Onamuga looks after, I think, um, between 600 and 1,000 um, locals in various tribes around there. So being able to get water to that facility, fix up the facility, um, has blessed not just the, the Salvation Army station there, but the people surrounds. So on behalf of not just myself, but also the, the people in PNG and the, the local Northeastern Division, I want to say thank you to everybody for the way that you gave generously to allow us to be able to go over there. Um, so we're all going to say a few things. My biggest thing was the language barrier. Trying to convince them that I was the brains of the outfit was really difficult. So I don't it, have to it, do that it here. It was for us to understand as well. <laughs> don't have to do that here because you all know that. Um, the biggest thing I saw was the difference between the haves and the have-nots. was unbelievable. But the have-nots, so happy. Happy that we were there, happy that we could help them. It was spot on. So I had to introduce, I got stitched up <laughs> on Friday night. We had a farewell thing at the core and my lovely friend Mark stitched me up and I had to introduce everyone and so I've got to do that again today. So, 
So we'll start with the important people, the mechanic, Steve. Yeah, um, one of the biggest things that I felt was um, just the differences, as it was said, but between the young people that were there that were just happy as with next to nothing. And the, some of the officers we had there were brilliant. Ransom was one of the main officers that we worked with. Him and his family were the most beautiful people I've come across. They would give you anything, they would laugh. But then you had the flip side of that where the local villagers, you'd see the guys walk in from other villages and you knew they weren't local to there because they'd have a little machete on them that was nearly a metre long. So you'd have the contrast between the lovingness of people that were there but also the offset of the danger that could be in the area and the uncertainty of things. It was almost like those that love God don't worry but those that don't quite know God proper yet have got a lot of uncertainties in their life and that was one of the biggest things that stood out to me. So, One thing about Kainantu is for me it was going home and my father and mother and I lived there in 1956. So can I remember that back that far? No. But the one thing that made me realise the benefits of what those people have is a great love of God. So just before we left Kainantu, there was a youth group night and just after it started, the power went out. Before the power went out, there was probably 40 or 50 people there. When we finished, the citadel was full. So God's light doesn't have to shine inside the church, it shines on the church, in the people. And I think that was fabulous because I had a bit of a laugh and thought if it happened here, we'd all pack up and go home. <laughs> Just to, to help you understand the thing about the electricity, you know how we all have 240 coming to our homes and we have a governing authority, so if it goes crook, they fix it for us. Over there, there's nothing like that, not at Onamuga. And the station, all it had were those um, solar panels that were being cleaned, at, uh, which went then to a battery and then inverted it to 240 volts. But if you plugged a jug in to boil some water for a coffee, all the breakers just went out. You, you had a blackout. So that's just, it, it's, yeah, it's hard to kind of comprehend. We live in such a, a country, you know, just total different culture. And, but the people were so satisfied, so happy. And I just say thanks to God for the experience of sharing with them. Yeah, so, yeah that's, that's all I went for. I had no, no specialties. I, yeah, they, they wouldn't let me touch the electricity. So, um, yeah, it was a lifter of heavy things. But... As everyone said, it's like it's a world of extremes. They're our closest neighbour. Like the northernmost part of Australia is a kilometre off PNG. But that's where it stops. You know, we flew Qantas, which was the, you know, the world's safest reliable airlines. And then we had to fly PNG Air, which was the complete opposite. So it, it was, that's just what it was. Everything was just, it wasn't a little bit different. They were just complete. So we stayed at Kainan 2, which is this photo here. Um, and it's a third world town, it was, it was dirty. You'd, but then you go up to Onamuga, which was up in the mountains, and you couldn't get a more serene, peaceful p place. But then, yeah, they don't have anything, but um, they're just extremely happy. And it really sort of, you know, it, it did touch that we think, we, yeah, as I said, the lights go out, well, we pack up and go, well, that's just life for them, and they just, just get on with it, and they're just so happy people. Well, one thing that's been a theme is just the contentedness of the people. And it was just so overwhelming to see how content the people were with so little. But it was also quite overwhelming to see how, how much generosity flew, flowed out of their contentment. So this is like a billing bag. How cool is this bag? And this is like one of, I don't know, I think I got six. Six beautiful billing bags which are like, homemade they made these and it takes them like two weeks two weeks to make a bag like this and yeah these people that have nothing they so willingly 
just kept giving and giving and every day they'd bring something to the house, bananas or sweet potatoes or something. Whatever they had, they'd bring. Yeah, so many sweet potatoes, yeah. Yeah, um, just open-handed living, that's what impacted me, yeah. So this was my sous chef. And um, the boys just bought all this stuff. It was like being on ready, steady, cook. You know, here's your ingredients, go for it. But, you know, we made it work and we all survived. And spam, yes, spam. Spam is good. Um, spam. <laughs> Never knew it, but spam's all right. <laughs> um, but I just want to say thank you to our team. Um, we just had an absolute blast. We continue to pray for our uh, friends in Onamuga, uh, particularly Ransom's family. You did see a photo of Ransom uh, in that. Um, he's, we just got a video yesterday of um, Ruth's family. Um, their house was completely washed away. It is a very serious issue at the moment. So we pray for Ramson and Ruth and his family. Um, yeah, because... Uh, yeah, they're homeless and, uh, and life continues to, to be difficult. So as was mentioned in Kainan 2 on the Friday night, we um, had a family worship night and we joined with Kainan 2 core, which is about the same size as our core. And, um, and it was mentioned too that halfway through the night, the lights went out because the power had gone, which was actually a fairly common occurrence, we realised, in Kainan 2, the power often goes out. And, uh, and as Dave said, it didn't matter. We got our phone torches out and we continued worship and, and nobody left. Actually, as the night went on, more people came and we just continued worshipping. And, um, and the people at Kainan Tukor chose a song in English so that we could worship with them. And, and that song was The Goodness of God. And as we were surrounded by people that we didn't really know, people that embraced us enthusiastically, um, living completely different lives to us, yet singing with gusto the same song that we sing, worshipping the same God that we love. I thought to myself, God, you really are faithful and you really are good. So we're going to sing that song together now. Let's stand. Let's stand. <laughs>
second Bible reading this morning is from Isaiah 42, um, verses 1 and 6 to 7. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from, from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Amen. I love that, that line, the promise from God. I, the Lord, will take hold of your hand. Ben's, Ben's going to play for us the chorus, this beautiful song, In the love of Jesus there is all I need. This is a gift for us from um, the DHQ team in Papua New Guinea. It's nice, hey? It's got the, um, the bird of paradise and a, and a bark hut, which, yeah, people live in those. I saw lots of people living in those. It, yeah, it's for our core to say, to say thank you to us. So on Sunday, while the mission team were preparing to leave Papua New Guinea, uh, I received a, mis a message that Laith's great auntie Nancy was promoted to glory. And on Tuesday, the day after we returned, we heard the sad news that his uncle Ian, which is auntie Nancy's husband, she, that he had passed away too. Uncle Ian conducted the marriage ceremony for both Laith's and my parents, and he also dedicated Callum when he was a baby. And he started the Salvation Army's work in Papua New Guinea, which is something that I consider to be quite a bit more important. I haven't... <laughs> I haven't spent much time with Uncle Ian, just tiny pockets here and there, time that was precious. But I've heard stories from some of you, some of you that worked with him in the early days, and it sounds like such an amazing time. Time filled with adventure uncertainty, hardship, lots of experimentation. And I understand that Uncle Ian was a total visionary. My mum was an officer for a few years before I was born. And in her time, people from our territory could get appointed to PNG, just like they could to New South Wales, ACT or Queensland. Many officers over there didn't have electricity, running water or easy access to shops. Some had to wait for a weekly boat or truck to come with simple supplies. Imagine putting up your hand for ministry and 10 months later, you were sent far beyond your experience. And it wasn't only officers. Soldiers like Dacia and Peter also left all that was familiar to go and serve. And today that place is still like another world. When we reached Onamuga, I said to Joe. This just doesn't feel real. It's like we're in a movie. The whole time we were in PNG, we never saw any other white people, only at the air airport or the American village. It was, it was like we were celebrities. Like 
I meant to wave at everyone. <clears throat> Everywhere we've, yeah, dogs feared us. Like you had to keep your distance or they growled at us. It's because we were so rare. And, and like I said, people still, what was that? keep that to myself <laughs> people people still live in bar huts I made a stupid mistake of asking um, the officer's daughter at Kainan 2 which is somewhat more developed than on Amuga if she watched the Olympics and of course she hadn't because and she had no idea of what I was talking about because she doesn't have a TV and she hardly even had lights in her house when we, when we arrived on Amuga, we were welcomed by people in tribal dress, singing a song, a kind of wailing and, and shaking of cane sticks. and It was really cool, but very foreign. And to be honest, there was some danger involved in our trip. The Pope was in PNG while we were there, due to a massive landslide, which killed 162 people in the highlands, and we were in the highlands. <laughs> And as we passed a certain bend on the way to our, our accommodation on our first night, the PNG officer, Captain Ransom, who was accompanying us, he told us that rascals had intercepted a bus just that past week and shot the driver and the entire bus load went over the cliff on that very bend. <laughs> Half the hospital facility at Onamuga was in disuse due to tribal fighting they once used it as a training facility but had to give up on that because it was just too unsafe. And while, the, and while helping the locals, some of our team stumbled across a large illegal marijuana plantation <laughs> within walking distance of the Salvation Army facility while we were staying. And I'm quite sure none of them smoked any. <laughs> well, they might have pretended though. <laughs> And, um, and Leith was a bit mortified when he saw that I'd entered a pathology lab without any protection where they treat patients with TB. And bearing all of this in mind, a question arises. Why go there? It costs a lot of money. And obviously there is risk. And we don't speak the language. And it takes us away from family and friends. And it takes time and effort. And there is discomfort. This was the first time I've had to forego a shower for a whole week, apart from the one freezing one in the middle. And that experience created for me the same amount of adrenaline as a roller coaster ride. <laughs> I now know for sure how much of a princess I really am. I like my hot showers. <clears throat> I remember early on in the Bible, in Genesis 12 2, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. This was a promise to Abraham, a covenant. A covenant means agreement. And Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. The covenant was not just meant for Abraham, but for all of his descendants, all of God's children. You are blessed to be a blessing. That was the agreement from the beginning. In Isaiah 42, 1, 6, and 7, God also said, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I'll take hold of your hand, I'll keep you, and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. Now God was speaking to his people about the servant, who we know to be Jesus. Skip over to the New Testament, and one of my many favourite parts is found in Luke 4, when Jesus, right at the start of his public ministry, straight after his wilderness experience, he goes to the synagogue in his hometown, Nazareth, and he's handed this scroll from Isaiah containing a very similar text. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners. And he reads it with such authority that everyone's eyes are fixed on him. And then he makes the amazing declaration. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, sadly, they don't react well. <clears throat> 
The thing is that later Jesus makes it clear that he wants his followers to serve others just like him. Think of the time that he washes the disciples' feet. And he's not just talking about serving people that are like us. Jesus wants justice. He wants his love to be spread to all people everywhere. And I think sometimes we consider the Great Commission, the last commandment that Jesus made while he was here on earth, which was to spread the gospel, the good news, to all the nations, as an add-on concept stuck on at the end. Yeah, we think of it as stuck on at the end. But in reality, it's the culmination of a theme that's, that's permeated throughout, throughout the Bible since the beginning, and it continues all the way throughout until the end of the Bible. In the epistles, we see how the gospel was preached and spread faithfully far and wide by, by Jesus' disciples. And I think the entire mission team would agree that we are very blessed that we're very rich in many things. And there are some things that we now feel blessed about that we might have taken grant for granted before. Things like running water, hot water, electricity, safe roads, sterile health facilities, easy access to shops and cheap groceries. Think of how many things that we have on top of these basics. So, so many things. Can you count your blessings? I don't think I can. I can start to try. They go on and on, and it's, and it's kind of fun to try. <laughs> I, think, um, I think most of us can relate when we say that we're blessed people. So we're all called to be a blessing to others. That's the agreement. I interpret the Great Commission as to all people everywhere, which I know seems kind of impossible, but the way I go about this is by trying to take up the challenges and the opportunities that God places before me to the best of my ability. In our situation, we weren't necessarily ministering to people who hadn't heard the gospel. Well, we don't speak their language, but we encouraged and we shared love. Our mission in this case was using our resources, gifts and skills to build up the ministry that existed this too is a way of spreading the gospel. Well, there was this one moment the night before we were leaving on a muga. Mark mentioned this moment. When the villagers put on a muumu, the feast with vegetables cooked on the rocks, and then they presented us with handmade gifts. Some of the guys got spears. We all received numerous billen bags, which take two weeks to make. And then they stopped for photos. Then the next day the giving continued when some children wagged school to say goodbye. One girl bought a bracelet that she wove and um, another brought bananas, maybe the fifth bunch that we received that week. And, um, and they said, we want to carry them for you. This kind of generosity continued into Kainan too. So much acceptance, so much love and generosity from people that we hardly knew and who have so little. If you ask anyone from the mission team, I think we'd all say that we believe we've come home more blessed than the people that we went over to bless. Those people taught us so much about open-handed living. But even if we did not meet such beautiful people in such a delightful location, I know that we would have been blessed in return. When we join with God in his mission of blessing others for the sake of the kingdom, well, that is what we're meant to do. There's blessing in simply living out the life that God calls us to live. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed when we live to bless others. So how can I apply what I've experienced, how I live here in my everyday life? Something that I loved about my experience away was doing it together. We were able to encourage each other along the way to help and to look out for each other, to share the stories, to bounce ideas off one another and to troubleshoot, to share our skills, to laugh and to pray. It wouldn't have been half as fun if I'd have done it alone. And I actually think that's how we're called to live for God back here as well, a lot of the time. <laughs> and I learned from others about open-handed living. 
I went over having experienced much generosity. You all have been incredibly generous in giving to this mission that we just went on. What I experienced in PNG continued this theme in a major way. Seeing the people so content with so little and ready to keep giving, well, it makes me want to be more generous. I am blessed to be a blessing. And I also learned that my attitude matters. The way that everyone in Kainan who chose not to let the lights at Friday worship, or the lack of lights, to be an issue, but simply continued with an attitude of worship and encouragement. Well, I want to live for God like that. And from Jesus, I learned that it's right to look outwards, beyond where it's comfortable, for opportunities to serve and to bring hope, healing, freedom and justice. There's going to be opportunities for each of us this week to make a difference in our world when we make ourselves available for God. I want to live every day as a blessed person who brings blessing to others. There is nothing more fulfilling than living out the whole life that God calls us to. We are blessed to be a blessing. It can be uncomfortable. It can be costly. But as we go to bless with what God has given us to share, whether that's a thoughtful encouragement or a hand to help, time to listen, a prayer inviting God to make a difference in their situation. As we go and live available to God, looking to bless others, it's there that we discover that we're blessed again. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been singing the song, Flow Through Me. Tommy Walker, the guy who wrote He Knows My Name, he wrote this song after visiting the Dead Sea. And he noticed that this body of water was stagnant and lifeless. We need to experience God, fresh experiences of God, and then to let that flow through us so that we can share his blessing in his world. It's been a rich morning this morning. We are blessed by God and blessed to be a blessing. This song is a song for us to take out into our week this week. It's also a song of celebration and a song that declares, I want your love to flow through me. So we're going to sing it as our sending song this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand. And let's, let's sing together, Flow Through Me. Let your love, let your love be pouring out, pouring out of me. Let your love
now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.